four yards of offense, and uh, the defense again was outstanding. Defense has stepped up and uh, played well on almost every occasion. We've had maybe one or two letdowns, and, and uh, but they're doing a nice job. Kicked him in the corner most of the day. They kept trying to bring it out to the middle, and that was not good for field position for the Tigers. We knew we had to win the special teams. Uh, we haven't really won the special teams since the opening game, and, and in this game we did. Ed Berman dominates again. Two and a half sacks for him, closing in on the record. And Rob Bird had a fabulous game at linebacker. Robbie's been been a great football player for us all year. He really got himself ready to play, and he's having a big year. This time you go on a 17-play drive, hold the ball for uh, over six minutes, and again, don't come up with anything, but you really kind of establish the line of scrimmage in this drive and, and move the ball to the air pretty well. Well, we thought the field would get better as the game went on. The field was in real poor shape, a lot of standing water on it, and uh, unfortunately, as the game went along, it didn't get better. And I think had it gotten better, we would have played better on offense. Fox completed 14 of 26 passes for 121 yards. I think the thing that impressed me most of these throwing interceptions. I thought our offense did a really nice job of, of holding on to the ball. We had the one turnover that hurt us, but other than that, on that field, for both offenses, not to turn the ball over more than they did was a real credit to the, the players. But now moving the ball down and then getting down in the red zone again and uh, would have to bog down and try a field goal. And the footing just very, very difficult for anybody to try to make field goals. It looks like Miller just didn't quite get enough on it. Well, you see him slide right there, and, and the ball hits the upright. It's just uh, nobody's fault. Just the footing wouldn't allow him to plant and, and kick the ball. It seemed to be a game that was going to be very difficult for somebody to make a last-second field goal to win. Well, I, I uh, felt after that field goal that you had to be almost point-blank range in order to kick a field goal. As we will see a little bit later, Towson State gets down a little bit closer. We'll move on to the highlights a little bit later on in the first half. Again, neither team had scored, and it looked like neither team would score, as the defenses uh, were really outstanding for both teams, and I'm sure that the weather had a lot to do with that. Weather, but both teams coming in were ranked in the top 15 or 20 in, in 1AA defenses, and so I think that, you know, uh, both defenses were good, and they played that way. Bucknell's defense now ranked number seven in the country. Little and Berman combined there to get the quarterback, Kevin Smith, who sacked five times, and previous to this game, he'd only been sacked seven. Well, uh, we've been doing a pretty nice job of getting pressure uh, all year, and, and that just continued in this game. One of Towson's best weapons was punter Ben Gossard, and here Mike Phillips a good, good return of 12 yards. We really did a nice job in the first half of playing field position. We played this whole half pretty much in their territory and, and really kept them at bay this way. It was really the only drive of the first half for Towson State. They're going to move it down into field goal range, and uh, Towson has some nice receivers. They a nice job catching the ball. Well, they're going to have a good football team for a few years. They uh, played a lot of young football players in this. You guys stopped uh, Washington, the running back, pretty good. Here's his backup, Maurice Sidney, who's got some speed, good change of pace back. Yeah, he, he gives him a different dimension. He can get on the outside in the perimeter and really run. And Washington, will see, carrying the ball here, did not have much. Uh, 65 yards for him on the day. Came in averaging 145, low center of gravity for that guy. Well, it was a good feel for him to play on, and I think it's, uh, it was really important for us to try to keep him from, from having big numbers because he's the kind of back that's going to run well on that kind of field. But Pat Keeley has played well lately for you. He's uh, played tough every day. Now, this is the play Bucknell would score a touchdown on. Question of whether lateral was forward or sideways. Very, very close to call, and uh, Terrence Parham getting the lateral from George Hwanitz, and that's the only score in the first half. Pretty obviously a lateral to me. And we'll take a look at it from ground level. It looked like it was going to be a fake for Towson State. They had a backup quarterback in the game, but it never got going. And I'm not so sure that they would have even kicked it, even if, if they had tried that. Yeah, I, I, you know, when they lined up for it, I didn't think they'd be able to kick it just because of the footing. And, and uh, as we looked at the film, we thought they were trying to fake on that play. So, Coach, what was the mood in the locker room at the half? It looked like it was going to be 0-0, and all of a sudden, the last 25 seconds of the half, you're all of a sudden ahead 7 nothing. Well, we still weren't real satisfied. We'd had a couple chances down deep in their territory and hadn't put points on the board. And, and uh, uh, we, we felt good that we were leading and we knew we were going to get the ball in the second half, but we were really working hard to try to get our kids ready to go back out in the second half and take the opening kickoff and do something with it. You guys have stuffed two running backs in the last two games, Chad Levitt and Randy Washington, who have done a great job this year. What was the key to doing that? Well, you, you have to pursue. You have to play good, sound fundamentals. You have to take on blocks, not run around blocks, and, and read your keys, and, and then you have to run, and you have to get enough people that when one person hits him and slows him up, that the posse's coming, and we do a pretty good job with that. We, we made that uh, decision early in the going. We were going to put more speed kids on the field, and, and I think it's starting to pay off. Talked a lot about defense today and last week, but one of the areas that Bucknell is extremely deep is in receivers. Five different receivers have at least 10 catches on the season, John McHenry takes a look at what makes them so good. This year, the Bucknell football team has been blessed with a spectacular core of receivers. 
Steve Nopum, O.J. Perkins, Mike Phillips, John Sikowski, and freshman Ron Rocket. Wide receiver coach Mike O'Connor tells the importance of the depth of the core. Pretty blessed that we have a you know an outstanding group of receivers. It's probably uh, on the on our team the position that has you know not only ability but depth, and you know depth is real important. You know not just for uh, a lot of different people being able to contribute, but you know we've been fortunate that we haven't had injuries, but along the way it's part of the game. And uh, you know if you do have some bumps and bruises or somebody goes down, we're in we're in a luxury uh, luxurious position where we've got some depth. Coach O'Connor describes learning discipline and catching and blocking during practice. Every day in practice, uh, the things we look for in our receivers are naturally the ability to catch the football and, you know, the athleticism that each one brings to his position in terms of being able to run down the field with speed, uh, having good feet in terms of change direction to be a good root runner, which is very important in this offense, being real disciplined and sharp in the kind of routes that we ask them to run. But blocking is a very important part of being a wide receiver. It's something we stress. We do something to do with blocking every single day in practice. Uh, you know, we'll do things against each other. We'll do things on bags. We'll work on the sled. We're always working our technique as far as our feet and our aim point and seeing. We talk about seeing, seeing the target, keeping a good low base, our, our butt down, uh, moving our feet. Steve Nopum describes the core's role within the West Coast offense. A little more off balance than, than uh and maybe the, you know, the system we had last year, you never know what we're going to do. And I think that's what the goal is of the offense, to keep the other team guessing what we're going to do. You know, you don't want to go run, run, and third down your passing because, you, you know, third and long. And you gotta, we're, just, we're just a little more sporadic in what we're going to do. O.J. Perkins tells us how his speed enables him to be a big play threat. I think I bring a lot to the, to the team. Um, I bring speed, you know. I bring a big play threat anytime I step on the field. I feel if, if Coach... If um, Jim Fox could get me the ball, I feel like I could break one every time I catch it. I have pretty good speed as a core. Our core receivers have pretty good speed, but I think I bring a little more. And that's that's fun to. I bring really the big play threat. Yeah. John Sikowski explains how he and Nopum are there for big plays because of their experience. Probably the leaders of the group, because uh, we have the experience and, and, and we've been starting for a couple games. Um, I think we try to set a standard. The two of us. And uh, and just be and be there for when the team needs us to on third and third and seven or second and long. Or so. Freshman Ron Rocket tells us how he's fitting in as a varsity player. I wanted to play varsity. I really did. I never really expected to play JV. So last year when um, I came up on my trip and all, I talked to Rich and I told Rich I wasn't gonna play JV. It. I mean, I don't know exactly how it makes me feel. I'm not used to playing JV, so it's like normal. High school, I never played JV, so. I feel like I'm fitting in where I'm supposed to be. All, all five of us, you know, Phillips, Sikowski, me, Nopum, and Rocket, either one of us could catch the ball and make the big plays. And I want people to say, hey, that was, that was the best core receivers Bucknell has ever had. For the Bucknell football program, this is John McHenry. Thanks, John. And, Coach, it really is a deep position. Uh, a lot of talent at wide receiver. You ever been with a group where there's uh, so much uh, con contributions by so many different people? Well, we've, we've uh, you know, tried to build that into our offense. We knew that this was a good group and that, that uh, in order to diversify the offense and, and to spread it out, that we were going to have to not just hone in on one receiver. And, and because we had the talent, we felt that was the best way to get everybody to contribute. Seems like it makes it tougher for the defensive units as well because you really can't double anybody. Sure. I mean, you, you go out and you get into third and long and you try to pick one or two receivers that you're going to double, and you still have one or two that, that are getting single coverage. So. Uh, it's a real advantage to have these kids. What ways have they improved most this season? I think in their concentration, learning the offense, and, and uh, catching the football. I think the one skill that you can probably increase the greatest during a four-year period of college is the ability to catch a football. Uh, the years that I was in, in the WAC and watched BYU and develop receivers, I think that the one thing that impressed me the most was the way that their receivers came in as what I always felt were fairly average group of receivers and by the time they came out they wouldn't drop a pass and I think the skill level that you can develop in, in catching the football is the one area that our kids have improved the most in. We'll be back in just a moment to take a look at second half highlights again. Bucknell led Towson State at the intermission 7-0. We'll be back after this.
Finally, a food carrier designed to carry food. New Pyrex Portables. Thermal packs keep food hot or cold for hours. Pyrex Portables, the way to go. Since 1846, scholars have come together at Bucknell to ask questions and explore answers. Inspired by the fresh spirit of the newest student and the seasoned wisdom of the faculty, this meeting of minds fosters achievement. Bucknell professors enjoy national reputation, and Bucknell students are known for their intelligence. Their lively exchanges extend from classrooms and seminars to informal meetings in faculty offices and the campus snack bar. Bucknell is a comfortable place for the tradition of the classics and the demands of today's society. The arts, humanities, and sciences thrive alongside professional programs in engineering, education, management, and music. The environment for this growing diversity and the ongoing meeting of minds is a very beautiful campus in central Pennsylvania. Bucknell's stately buildings and beautiful trees and gardens provide an ideal collegiate setting. Bucknell, with 3,300 undergraduates and over 260 faculty members who sustain the spirit that is this university and who carry it with them throughout their lives. Finally, a food carrier designed to carry food. New Pyrex Portables. Thermal packs keep food cold or hot for hours. Pyrex Portables, the way to go. Score was 7 nothing at the half. Bucknell leading. And Coach, I know you like to defer, and you must have been very pleased with the developments at the beginning of the third quarter. Well, this is what we had planned. You know, this is why you defer, so that you can get the ball to start of the second half. And we've had a couple games this year where we've taken the, the opening kickoff of the second half and haven't done anything with it and got ourselves in trouble. And this time, we really made some big plays. Uh, Perkins' uh, uh, return of the opening kickoff and then to drive the ball in and score was really a, a big part of the game. Let's go to the videotape and take a look at both angles of O.J. Perkins' kick return. First time this season he's been back there and paid off big. Yeah, he paid off big, and I think maybe they made a mistake. They kicked into the wind, and the ball didn't go very far, and he was able to catch it on the run, and, and we were able to... Uh, uh, put a body on a body as far as the return goes and, and keep anybody from coming free and he just hit the crease and took off. Again, it was the longest kick return for either team of the day. Get it out to the 39 and then he's going to come up with a big catch uh, from Jim Fox picking up 26 more and then Rich Lemon will take it into the end zone. Yeah, this, like I say, this was a big drive. Took three plays to negotiate it and get it in. A great block there by Jeremy Meyer and Rich bounces outside and score a 14-0. Looks like we have a chance now to maybe open this thing up and and uh, we're going to get in a, a break here, and we don't take advantage of it, and, and uh, Towson does, comes back and, and gets back into Your the game. Your defense is going to bottle him up. Good kick by Coleman, forcing uh, Hall to go back to the goal line, and then Boyle and Purcell will finish him off at the five, and your defense forces a punt, and your special teams tips the ball. Yeah, we, get, we block the punt. And like I said, we won the special teams battle, in my opinion, and, and uh, have a chance now, have the ball first and ten on the 16-yard line, and, and don't get any points out of it. Here's Towson State again, bottled up. Everybody swarming on Washington. This will be a third down play. Good pressure will force Smith to throw it away. And the pass uh, flutters high over the head of Easy. And now you're going to come up with the ball inside their 20, thanks to Scotty Glover's block punt. Yeah, Glover did a great job. We had talked to him the night before about accelerating off the line of scrimmage, expecting to block this thing, and he finally did it and, and uh, made a big play. And Bucknell then would turn it over on their third play. The first play would be a run to Lemon, would not get much. And on third and long, back to pass. And Towson had good pressure on this play. Yeah, I thought our kids did a great job of blocking. This is a blitz, and, and he, he comes in. We didn't do a good job of, of reading the blitz and dumping the ball off, which we had done earlier, and, and the kid hit Jimmy in the back and forced the fumble. And now momentum is swung over to the black and gold side, and as we look at the, the highlights a little further on, they're going to move it down and get their first score. They got a little momentum going, and, and once an offensive line sort of senses that they've got the ball moving, they get bigger and they play harder, and I think that's what happened on this drive. And, and the real swing came when they blocked our punt, and we had to try to stop them. Let's take a look at the highlights now. Towson State would go on the march, an 80-yard drive for themselves to cash in and make it a 14-0 uh, game, a 14-7 game. And really, if you think about it, Coach, it could have been 21-0. Well, that's what I mean. If we had taken advantage of the block with 21-0, we might have been able to take them out of the game. But and we're just not uh, far enough along to do that yet, I guess. A couple of nice catches. Uh, they mixed the run and the pass well here, and uh, this was by far their best drive of the day. They're nice. This was a big play here. This was a third down, about seven, and they, they swing the ball off and, and get the first down. And then they're going to throw it easy along the sidelines, and the fullback, who'd only carried, I think, seven or eight times all season, is going to pick up a 17-yard run for a touchdown. Yeah, he had run the trap a couple times, and even ran it later on, and we stopped it, but they, uh, they block it well there and, and uh, get it in. A lot of defense the rest of the way. Bucknell on the next drive is going to 
pick up a first down, eat up some valuable time as Sikowski will make the catch just short of the first down. And I love this call in third and one going to the tight end, Cal Wilcox. Well, we had banged it up in there for the most part, and, and so it was time to, to change up our tendencies and throw the ball on third and short, and it was a great call by Coach Maropolis. And now this will be another drive after you really got cheated a yard on the change at the end of the quarter. Jeremy Myers doesn't quite make it, and here's a play you're talking about where Towson really sees the momentum, getting a block punt of their own, but your defense was ready for the task. Yeah, this is, this is where the game uh, swung, I, I feel. They have the ball deep in our territory, and our, our uh, defensive kids go out and what we call sudden change and stop them. What's the mindset when they go out there at that time? Well, I think the first thing they have to realize is that the other team's going to be pumped up, and you can't feel sorry for yourself. You have to go out there with the idea that you love to play the game no matter where the ball is and, and do it and, and play with confidence, and they did that. And here comes third down. You're going to get great pressure and force an intentional grounding call against Smith. And I think much like they saw at the end of the half, they felt that they were not in field goal range at this time. Uh, two really big plays. The, uh, the uh, ineligible receiver and throwing the ball, the grounding call right there was a loss of down. Now the sack, and that really takes them out and, and reestablishes field position for us. They had the ball on inside our 20. Now we get it outside the 30. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a big play for us. This time you get a good punt by Rich Miller. Protect it well and uh, again change the field position and uh, we're going to see one offensive play and the rest will be defense. Excuse me, this is a play coming up here for Towson State, a third and two. They're trying to keep things alive and they don't make it. Well, we, we uh, they went to an unbalanced and our kids saw it and made a really good adjustment and uh, made the play. This was a key third down play, excuse me here, that uh, we just missed there. Uh, to take a look at Fox was scrambling for yardage yeah. on third and seven. He's done that several times. Did a couple times against Penn and one time against Lafayette in big games, and, and he did it again and, and uh, kept field position for us. And your defense was able to wrap things up pretty well, uh, hold them, coming up with a couple big stops late in the game and, and force the turnovers. Well, the defense was playing with a lot of confidence. Uh, uh, felt like they had sort of the tempo, reestablished the tempo in the game, and, and I don't know, uh, you know if they would have ever let them score at that point. Final score, Bucknell won it by the score of 14 to 7. What we're going to do right now is take this time out and then be back to talk with our special guests, Brian Gay and Terrence Parham. But first, these messages. Finally, a food carrier designed to carry food. New Pyrex Portables. Thermal packs keep food hot or cold for hours. Pyrex Portables, the way to go. This is Pat Farber with a wrap-up of the week in Bucknell Athletics. Caution, flammable. That warning is served to all upcoming opponents of the Bison women's volleyball team. The Neopowski squad improved its record to 21-5 with a sweep of its competition at the St. Peter's Invitational. Melissa Warden earned MVP honors at the two-day event. The women's tennis team won three matches to move to 10-6 on the year. The Bison have won four straight dual matches with two to go. Lee Raymond scored midway through the second half, but Princeton rallied to sport the BU women's soccer team's upset bid. On the men's side, Bucknell dropped matches to Penn State and Fairleigh Dickinson. In field hockey, the Bison came up on the short end of a pair of decisions to Colgate and Georgetown. Megan Bossett tallied a goal and an assist in the setback. And the orange and blue water polo program ventured westward last week, winning one of four against stiff competition at the Claremont Mud Invitational. Tim Nesvik had nine goals for BU. That's your Bison Weekend Review. Finally, a food carrier designed to carry food. New Pyrex Portables. Thermal packs keep food cold or hot for hours. Pyrex Portables, the way to go. The inaugural event for one of Bucknell's newest clubs. Alumni, parents, and friends of Bucknell are welcome at the kickoff cocktail party for the Club of Albany. Tailgate with other Bucknellians and watch hurdle and timber races throughout the day at the Far Hills, New Jersey race meeting at AT&T Moreland Farms. Come try out the Upper East Side's newest crowded bar. There are no drink specials, but they do make their own beer. That's a happy hour with the Bucknell Club of New York City. A semi-annual event for D.C. Bucknellians is the beer tasting event at Rumors. That's at 19th and M Streets, Northwest in Washington, D.C. The Bucknell Club of Denver will be having a happy hour at the Rock Bottom Brewery. That's at 1001 16th Street in Denver. And finally, St. Louis alumni, parents, and friends are welcome to meet President Adams when he visits St. Louis. Hear about Bucknell today and plans for the future. 
Welcome back to Bucknell Football 95. Joining us, senior offensive tackle Brian Gay and sophomore cornerback Terrence Parham. And Brian, we'll start with you. How does it feel to be healthy this year? At least I think you're healthy. <laughs> yeah, it feels, uh, feels a lot better than it did last year, um, you know, with my knee, I guess. Uh, uh, it was rough, you know, going through the season last year with the injury, but, you know, I really rolled the dice and came out on top and got lucky. And uh, surgery went well, uh, the recovery and the rehab went well. I have a lot to uh, a lot to be thankful for, and Steve Zender and the athletic training staff, I owe a lot to them because they are. Uh, they really pushed me through, so it feels good to be healthy and looking forward. Right, to let's talk about. We normally talk about past games. Let's talk about the coming game, Lafayette game. I think, sure. especially since senior one, people are pointing for. Oh, big one. We thought about it ever since that day um, in October last year. You know, last year we had a circle on our schedule as a big game, and we really came out and laid an egg. So uh, we're looking for this as a big game. And we've won two in a row, but it's time for us to really step up and stop talking and start working. Terrence, we saw the highlights of your play for a touchdown. Tell us how that play developed. Oh, well, at that point in the game, I was just trying to really look to make something happen. But I wasn't really sure. I wasn't able to do because the field was so muddy. But uh, they filmed with a snap, and that just made my job that much uh, easier. Who called for it? Did George tell he was going to throw to you, or did you uh, uh, ask for the ball? I was calling for the ball, and I didn't know if he heard me, but he did. And he pitched it, and I just ran the rest of the way. And you knew they weren't going to catch you? <laughs> I don't know how close they were behind me, so I just knew uh, just don't look back and just run as fast as you can. Brian, as an offensive player, what does the offense need to do to beat Lafayette on uh, Saturday? I just think we have to start clicking on all cylinders, Bob. We've had t games in the past where the, the running game has worked real well. And we've had other days when the passing game has worked real well. But at the same time, we haven't been able to put both of them together. But uh, as each week has gone on, we've made less and less mistakes. And I think that's a key, really, to getting our offense moving. And once this offense sits on all cylinders, look out, because there's not a whole lot that's going to be able to stop it. You guys becoming more comfortable together in the offensive line? You got, I know you got a lot of new faces this year. Yeah, definitely. We've had a good freshman starting with us for, uh, for the last three or four games. And, uh, He's come along real well, and I think he's feeling more comfortable with the new offense. It's taken us a little time to get used to things, but I think things are starting to really come together, and I'm, I'm excited about the coming weeks. Terrence, the defense ranked seventh in the country in uh, defensive yardage. Uh, what do you think are the keys for the defense to be successful Saturday? I just think uh, we have to play like we've uh, played against Cornell and uh, Town to State these past couple weeks, and uh, if, we're, if we're able to do that, then I don't think there's uh, too many offenses that can do much with us. You're playing in the secondary. Has it uh, been a group that's, that's worked pretty well together this season? You guys have uh, done a good job. I think so because uh, basically uh, most of the guys are back, you know, from last year. And uh, we just come together and uh, play like a group and everything works out for us. As we look ahead to the rest of the season, uh, kind of nice to be at home, isn't it, Brian? With two games left, it seems like uh, we've been one on the road all the time. Yeah, it's going to be different playing at home. But, uh, you know, I think we've adjusted well and, and we've become a good road team. But uh, a couple weeks at home should be nice. As we look uh, down the road uh, to yourself, Brian, uh, finishing up your senior year, what are your plans for the future? I know that uh, it's been a good four years for you here, Buck, now. Yeah, I've enjoyed them. I'm an economics major. Looking for a job right now. Hopefully I can get into uh, investments or some sort of uh, financial planning, something along that, that line. But still four games left, right? Still four games left. Four very big Saturdays left. Okay. And Terrence, what about you? What are you majoring in? I know you're from out in the Pittsburgh area. Probably have a lot of people watching you today on the show. I hope so. Uh, right now I'm majors on management and I'm a minor in legal studies. And you want to you want to go to law school? Hopefully, right? hopefully I go to law school. You weren't the one out there litigating some of those calls for the Bucknell defense when you talked to the referee, <laughs> are you? No, I left that up to uh, Bird and Berman. Okay. So. Well, Terrence and Brian, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show, uh, visiting with us. Best of luck against the Leopards this Saturday. <laughs> Terrence Parham and Brian Gay, our guests, will be back with more after this timeout. You're watching Bucknell Football 95. Bucknell Football 95 is sponsored by Corning Incorporated. Corning, who provides catalytic converters for your car, optical fiber for your voice, video, and data communications, and cookware for your home, is an enthusiastic supporter of Bucknell students, faculty, and staff who are committed to excellence both on and off the football field. Corning Incorporated is a diversified products and services company with a strong commitment to technological excellence and innovation. Hi, I'm Rick Hartzell, Director of Athletics at Bucknell University. Bucknell has a well-documented and unmatched legacy of success in combining quality academics with competitive Division I athletics. Our record of academic All-Americans, Patriot League scholar athletes, and student athletes who make our dean's list is exemplary. In addition, our 26 men's and women's teams are successful on the courts, fields, and in the pool, winning three consecutive Patriot League President's Cups and two men's and two women's all-sports championships over the past five years. I would invite you to join our winning team by contributing to the Bison Club. The Bison Club is the fundraising arm of our athletic department, which supports all 26 Division I intercollegiate programs. In the past year, we have 2,700 members and over $500,000 raised. The Bison Club members have become a vital and integral part of our success. Join now and help support the legacy of excellence, which is Bucknell Athletics. 
For more information, write to the Bison Club in care of Bucknell University or call 717-524-1358. Well, we're back in a Patriot League action this week, a home game against Lafayette. Lafayette usually is so, so outside the league, but they've won 14 of their last 16 league games. What makes them so tough in conference? Let's play with great confidence when they get into league play. They, they played a great football game against Holy Cross. Their offense really opened up, and, and they had some big numbers, which they had not done up until last week. And so just by the time they're getting ready to play us, they, they're starting to come together. I know this is a game you guys have been pointing for for a long time. Well, I think that when you come into a league where you have someone who's dominated the league like they have, and they have such a great record in the league, that if you want to get to the top of the league, you have to be ready to play at the level of the top teams. And they're the top team. They're, they're the ones that you have to... I think that in order to win this league, you have to be able to beat Lafayette. And what do you think, the quickly, the keys are to doing that on Saturday? Well, we've got to take care of the ball, play with good field position, and we've got to get the ball in the end zone when we have our chances and continue to play well on defense. I asked you last week it was going to be high scoring or low scoring. You thought it might be high, but I'll give you a break with the weather on that one. Well, I, I, uh, I thought both offenses had enough weapons to open it up, but uh, with the weather and the field conditions the way they were, there weren't going to be a lot of points. You expect it high, low this week? Yeah. Uh, I would think it'll be a low-scoring game. I think both teams are pretty dominant. We're both 1-2 in the league in defense, and, and so I would think that would hold true in this game. kind of game I like. Rock em, sock em defense, field position makes a difference, a good football game. Well, I think it'll be that. Well, Coach Gad, I want to thank you for visiting with us on the program. We'll take a look at those highlights against the Leopards next week. Thanks, Bob. For Coach Tom Gad, this is Bob Beeler speaking. Thanks for watching. Tune in again next week, same time, same station.